be here and happy that you could all uh, join us today. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm sort of following on to what the other mic said, uh, which is really to talk about the intellectual property issues that surround a, a, a company start. And if, if you're expecting sort of the patent 101 type of uh, talk, well, we'll touch on a few things, but it's not really uh, the purpose. And obviously, if you have a question that kind of go to, you know, basic patenting and, and the process and things like that, happy to answer them. So as far as, um, you know, if you'd like to ask questions as we go along, feel free. So, does this work? So these are the topics I was going to talk about today, which um, basically all get down to things that are going to come up if you're trying to start a company and things that are going to be important to people that want to put money into your enterprise, or at least consider it. So we're looking at patenting. So basically when we talk about patenting from the standpoint of you having patents, it's, the idea is, do you have protection, or at least are you trying to get protection for uh, your idea so that nobody else can um, can practice. And, and by the way, we do have a few slides over here on the table uh, to the extent they run out, which they very, may very well. Uh, just give us your cards and we'll, we'll get you copies. So patenting is one thing people look at in, in the stamp, from the standpoint of uh, company starting. Am I, if I give you this money, are you going to be able to uh, have an exclusive position um, as the company goes forward, or is your lunch going to be eaten by some big company someday if your idea is great? Freedom to operate. So this is, this is kind of a term of, of art. It's basically, am I going to be able to move forward with my technology, um, or is there a problem with that somebody else has a patent or some other um, right that's going to get in the way of it and that I'm going to be in violation of whatever that right is if I do move forward? And basically, these two things kind of go to a, a, a point I always try to make in these presentations, um, which is, if um, do you need a patent to go forward with uh, your technology? Do you, if you've got, a, if you've got an idea, can you go forward and, and um, start a company if, um, without a patent? And the answer is yes, you can. Okay, well. Um, if just, just because you do have a patent, does that mean you'll be able to go forward with your right? And the answer is no. So that's the, you know, there's a distinction between getting a patent and dealing with somebody else's patents. And they are um, highly distinct topics, yet uh, for many people that aren't uh, familiar with uh, the ins and outs of patents, difficult to get their arms around. Okay, what, uh, another issue that's going to come up, which Mike kind of talked about uh, a bit, which is uh, inventorship or ownership. And basically this um, all surrounds the issue is, okay, if I go and, um, and uh, have some technology that I want to use and there's patents around it, do I actually have rights in that, those patents? Or is, is somebody else holding those rights? Because it's just like you're, you, know, you own your house or you think you own your house. If you don't own your house, you're not going to be able to sell it to anybody. Nobody's going to, or nobody's going to rent your house if you don't have the title to it or the rights to it. And just to sort of uh, round things out, uh, talk about a few things beyond um, patents as far as intellectual property, which people sometimes get confused with. So let's start with patenting. And basically, you know, if you if you pay any attention at all to patents, there's people talk about patents, they talk about applications. And what are, what are these? What's the difference? Well, basically, the idea of um, getting a patent is it is an enforceable right. It has been a process that's uh, been gone through to establish what it is uh, you have the rights in as far as the technology that's in that uh, patent. And the way that's measured is in terms of what I have a right to prevent other people from doing. That's my right under a patent. And is something in the back of the patents, which if any of you have looked at them, called claims. And the claims establish the, the four corners of my rights. It's just kind of like, you know, akin to your, your, your deed on your property. It defines where the lines are. Well, the claims basically do that in the term, in the context of that I uh, have the right to prevent somebody else from doing X, whatever is covered by those claims. Well, how does a patent grow up to be a patent? And basically, it grows up to be a patent by filing a patent application. And there's a process that's fairly rigorous in the, uh, in the US Patent Trademark Office, for example, you can get patents in other countries, that um, puts you through your paces as far as establishing patentability. We'll talk about the terms of the, you know, what, what goes on with that. 
But the important thing to think of, it's not like going to you know, DMV and getting, you know, paying money and getting your driver's license. Like, this is a, a process that's got rigor and a patent uh, has gone through that process. And if somebody's got uh, protection uh, in a patent that, that has gone at least through a government process of, of proving your case. Not so an application. Application is start, you know, starting earlier on, and just because there are claims in an application doesn't mean the, the holder of that application is actually going to get those rights. Odds are things change as you go through the process, and an application may have claims that um, are very interesting, either from your standpoint as a, um, as, as a holder of those, uh, that application, that, oh, you think you're going to get very broad coverage. Uh, on the flip side, if you're looking at somebody else's application, uh, woe is me. This guy's got a very broad uh, claim in his application, and that's going to be a problem for me. So the point to remember is an application, you know, nobody's uh, settled on, on what rights are actually going to come out of that. It's just sort of what somebody's hoping to do. So we also, uh, I also identified up there some um, different forms of an application. So we have something called a provisional application which never grows, never does grow up and be a patent itself. And the idea of a provisional application is that it gets you a filing date. And then within, at least in the U.S., within a year of that, you can uh, file a formal application. So somebody says, you know, you watch, you know, I hate to pick on legal Zoom, but, you know, they, they say, oh, we'll file a provisional patent application for you. Um, well, that's good. It's a good thing to do. It's not like it's very hard, but the important thing is at the end of the day, it doesn't get you any right that anybody's going to be too excited about because within the year, the, the rights in a provisional uh, go through a sunset time and they're no longer anything. So the idea is a provisional gets you a filing date. So if you come to Scott or Eugene and you say, I'm going to be given a poster presentation on this uh, next week or worse, uh, and, you know, we can file. Yeah, I've had that. You know, I've gotten the old 4 o'clock call uh, <laughs> in the afternoon. You know, we have to do something. So um, we, can, we can deal with this. We can file a provisional patent application and at least uh, get you a filing date. And we'll, as we'll talk about in a minute, um, why that, that'll be important. So, like I said, within a year of that, you have to file a formal application. Now, provisional can kind of be a manuscript. It can look like a regular patent application. It can be any, anything you want to file. Um, there's a quality issue depending on what you do file, but you know there's not really any structure to those. Uh, a formal patent application is what would grow up to be a patent someday, hopefully, and that's much more structured. Now we also talk about PCTs. So what are PCTs? PCTs are basically a patent application that allows you to segue to getting patents in other countries. So in many industries. Um, licensees won't be terribly excited about uh, having only a patent in the U.S. So how do we, uh, we deal with that? Well, generally speaking, at appropriate times, we'll file a PCT application to um, preserve our rights uh, to go into other countries. It's, um, it's less expensive than actually going into the other countries, and basically it buys you time. Uh, Mike, if you could comment on filing provisional and strategy to buy another year. Yes. You know, back on the name. Sure, the sure. So, um, Basically, like I said, a provisional kind of gets you filing date, and within a year of that, you can um, you have to file a formal application, or you don't have anything. No, I'm, I'm buying, buying on the, uh, yes. on the oh, yes, okay. yes, yeah, I'm getting that now. When when that year is up, and you file your formal application, um, your term start your patent term starts on that date, not the date that you filed the provisional, the date you filed the formal. So the term is 20 years from when you file your formal application. On the other hand, um, so if you filed your, on, on day zero, you filed your formal application, your term ends 20 years later. On the other hand, if you file your provisional, and then you file your formal a year later, your term ends out at year 21. So there's some benefit if you're on a, in a technology that's kind of has, um, has a back-end value. So if you're in the pharmaceutical area, probably nobody really cares much about the first five, ten years because odds are the product is way behind the patent rights. On the other hand, uh, so having that extra year at the end might be very valuable. On the other hand, if you're dealing with, with um, software uh, or other technologies that mature um, and, and, um, and evolve more quickly, um, having that extra year may not be very exciting. Okay, so 
like I said, there's, there's, there's standards that the patent office goes through in whatever country to decide whether you get a patent. Is the invention new? So that's novelty. And just because it's new doesn't mean um, that you, you know, get a patent. No, that whatever is different about what you have has to be unobvious. Um, invention has to be useful. And there's certain requirements that you, you know, describe your invention properly to let people use it and that you describe the best way you know to use it. And just as an aside, um, to the extent anybody's heard anything about the America Invents Act or whatever they're calling it uh, right now, there is a whole move afoot right now to change our patent system uh, quite dramatically. And so if you hear anything about patent reform or anything else, um, this is a quite a profound event and will change certain things, like for example, perhaps not having to tell people about the best way you know to do, uh, to do your invention. So there's other things too which I'll, I'll sort of try to highlight as I go along that are going to come up with this. Uh, but it's got people in, in my field rather exercised about you know, hmm. what, what it's going to be. So prior art. This is, this is basically when we talk about novelty or obviousness, we, what do we measure um, our, um, you know, what are we measuring novelty against? And something called prior art. It's what is out there in the literature uh, that you're working against. And so basically, was it known or used? And this, so the first to uh, topic is talking about people other than you that did something. And it would be prior to when you made the invention. Now, this is an area that will all um, change uh, if we go through this patent reform because an invention, your date that you made the invention, that won't matter so much in the, in the, uh, the brave new world of patent reform. It'll all be about when you filed. But anyhow, for now, um, what did other people do before you made your invention? Did they know or use it? Did they patent it? Um, did they describe it in a printed publication? So, if you're going through um, a company start, people are going to be looking at all this. Uh, this is like the first thing, one of the first things people will do. They'll They'll go and say, okay, we're going to do a prior art search. I'm going to go look for all the literature that's out there and see if um, there's anything out there that's close and, you know, make my judgment about what it is you're really going to get. Because, you know, the mere fact that you get a patent isn't really what's important here. It's, it's what's the scope of the patent. Is it a broad patent that's going to keep people out um, in a way that's meaningful to your starting your company? Or is it going to be some um, small feature that nobody really needs to do to, to, to be competitive? So people are going to go and do, you know, the investors um, are going to look and see what kind of um, art is out there if they're doing their job properly. And this is the first thing they'll look at. The other thing they're going to do is they're going to do a Google search if, if we're talking about your technology and looking at uh, what you've done. You know, where, you know, have you put abstracts out there? Have you put posters out there? Have you published? Do you have other patents? And um, so the other aspect of prior art that we should touch on is, uh, it actually could be by other people as well as you, but it, you know, it really hits hard when we talk about you doing something that creates a problem for you getting protection someday. So we have something called public use. So that, most of these are, the first two are kind of commercial um, aspects of basically how you could shoot yourself in the foot as far as getting a patent. So if you go out and, and decide you're going to build whatever it is you have and, and you know, go out on campus and you know, show everybody it and, and um, demonstrate it, uh, that's, that's a public use, for example. If you're in a company and you decide you're going to sell or offer to sell your technology uh, before um, you file a patent application, that's what we're talking about here, um, that's, called on, that's an on-sale activity, that can be a problem if you patent or you publish. So again, you put a poster out there, um, due diligence is going to kick that out. I mean, right now when we file patent applications, the patent office routinely will look up, will take a look who are the inventors and we'll go and look up in, the, uh, in Google or whatever, find out what it is you're, you're out there um, doing and you know, count on it. If it's out there, they're going to use it against you. But if somehow they miss it, people doing due diligence are going to find this. So the moral of the story is you really want to get your patent applications on file um, before any of these events that you, uh, you carry forth with um, happen. Now in the U.S. we have something called a one-year grace period. So if tomorrow I go and uh, put a poster out and I wait uh, 300 days 